Hello, good morning again, everybody. Um, I want to kick this session off with some information in regards to the management and documentation that you're actually going to need for your grant. Um, the grant award workshop is going to focus on everything post award and your primary contact post award is going to be your grant administrators. Uh, what I do want to tell you is that we are very excited that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we appreciate everybody getting up early and, and joining us. And we are excited to be back doing workshops again with you guys. Um, we're looking forward to hopefully being able to, before too long, be more in person and be doing these workshops in person uh, so that we can chat with you face to face a little bit more. But in the meantime, and, and as you heard, as our funding is going down, we're doing the best that we can uh, to try to conserve funds as much as possible, uh, but also deliver high quality content to you. Uh, so that we can train you and everything that you need to be successful within these grants. So we do have a few new staff members that I just wanted to introduce briefly, uh, Jennifer Johnston and Medwin Metzger. Um, they uh, joined GCC after the last workshop. Now, this has been a couple years ago. Um, while we do try to keep brand administrators consistent, when we do have to redistribute job roles, just know that we can't always guarantee that the subrecipient you will always have the same grant administrator. Our grants administrators are responsible for processing reimbursements, budget adjustments, monitoring, and providing technical assistance. They also provide prior approvals for all the expenditures. They are your go-to for policy and technical questions. The grant administrators may not always have the answer right when you need it, but they're gonna work to find that answer and get back in touch with you to provide it to you. So one area that the GMs is going to be supporting you with is processing and receiving your reimbursements. So first, for completing reimbursements, you do need to understand your budget that was created in your grant application. That's gonna be key to the first step. You're gonna be completing your reimbursements for actual expenditures during one month periods, and you're gonna be using the approved line items that you created from the budget. Now, we require all grants when submitting a reimbursement to use the GCC summary pages for each expense category. These documents will be uploaded using the reimbursement checklist found on the GCC website and uploaded to the Enterprise Business Services. You may recognize that Enterprise Business Services is our new grant uh, administration module. Uh, it's a portal that allows us to be able to do all the services that we need to do uh, with our subrecipients and to interact. And in a later session today, Kevin Farrell will be sharing with you the EBS, uh, give you an insight into it, its functions and resources for working with new grants. So let me share the way to order your documents when you're doing reimbursements. So we ask that you try when possible to scan documents in portrait style. This is gonna allow the view from the grant manager's side to be much more consistent. And the expense cover sheet should be labeled as personnel A1, supplies B1, equipment C1, you kind of get the idea, so on and so forth. All supporting documents will be included within each category behind the cover sheet to form the expense category reimbursement packet. Supporting documents should be labeled with the category identifier and the page number. For example, the supporting documents under personnel can be cover sheet A1, timesheet A2, payroll register A3, and proof of payment A4. This is gonna allow your grant administrator to quickly locate the items that are within your packet. When you upload the packets to GEMS, you will upload each expense category separately. So there's gonna be one for personnel, supplies, contractual, travel, equipment, and operating expenses. We also ask that you use the recommended nomenclature for uploading these packets. Please use the nomenclature that you see here at the bottom. Reimbursements are due the last day of the month for actual expenses made during the previous month. So let's say it's September 30th, 2024. Your August monthly reimbursement is going to be due. If you submit on time in GEMS, our grant administrators have a goal to process the reimbursement, meaning to approve, deny, or send back for modification within 10 days. If you are late, the grant administrator will have 30 days from the time you submit to process the reimbursement. We don't want to hold up those that are on time with those that are late. Some notes to keep in mind. Final reimbursements are going to be due 60 days after the period of performance is complete. You can submit these early if you so choose. 
I wanted to make you aware of some continued changes due to the reduction of funds that GCC is receiving. In year two, your final budget adjustments are required to be made 90 days from the end of the period of performance without an approved justification. I want to highlight that with an appropriate justification for the adjustment, we do still allow these to go past the 90 day mark. So if something unforeseen does happen, like let's say another COVID, we are still going to support you with a budget adjustment. However, having remaining funds at the end of the grant and just wanting to spend the remaining funds is not a valid justification. Also discussed last workshop and continuing with this year, GCC is reverting remaining year one funds once you complete the final reimbursement for year one back to the federal recipient grant. This will allow GCC to better track remaining funds and better utilize these funds with our subrecipients. So once the final reimbursement is complete, you will check the final reimbursement box and the GM will sweep the remaining funds and then open your budget for year two. Keep in mind, all year one reimbursements are due to GCC you no know, later than 60 days after the end of the first year period. Projects that have not submitted their year one reimbursements and final will be placed on a hold. Documentation keeps us and you from having audit findings. And we would do not want you to have to repay any federal funds. We know that is not a fun task to have to do. So GCC must have adequate documentation for all your expenses, including a proof of payment in the form of a bank statement or a canceled check. So at this point, I wanted to invite Roxana Zalata Lewis to share more information on change requests. I don't hear Roxana. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. We can hear you now. Presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Roxana Celada Lewis, Tribes Management Supervisor, and I will be covering two areas today. The first will be change requests, followed by personnel and employee benefits. Non budgetary change requests. There are two types of change requests, also known as adjustments and modifications. The non budgetary change request is used for proposed changes to the originally approved grant agreement, such as an extension to the period of performance, changes to the scope of work. These changes include adjustments to the project's abstract narrative and changes to goals and objectives. Scope changes require prior approval from the planning team and your grants administrator. Personal updates and changes. These are changes to staff working on the project, new hires or replacement staff. Officials update are changes to the agency's authorizing official, project director, and financial officer. For this type of changes, a copy of the board minutes approving the appointment of the new official are required. All of these change requests are submitted through EBS. <clears throat> budget change requests. These are changes to the originally approved budget and can be made to reallocate funds between existing line items, to increase funds to existing line items, and to add new line items and new budget categories not previously included in the existing budget such as adding a travel category to a budget that did not have one on the originally approved budget. And to move funds between different budget categories, such as moving funds from personnel to supplies. Budgetary changes. Um, please remember that budget change requests are due 90 days before the end of the period of performance of your grant agreement. A justification must be included with your change request for EBS to accept the transaction. If you have questions or have concerns regarding your change request, discuss this with, the, with your grant administrator to ensure that allocation and expenses are allowable. If you're submitting a change request to increase salaries, the approved board minutes are required and must be uploaded to EBS. 
keep in mind that salary increases must be approved by the organization's board of directors for the entire staff in your organization and not only for grant funded positions. The change request cap rule, the 10% cap rule for grant awards of $250,000 or more um, budget changes are capped at 10% of the total award, meaning the transfers between direct cost categories, programs, and activities cannot exceed 10% of the total approved budget. Any changes to match funds require a budget change request. However, changes to match are not counted towards the 10% cap. There is no limit on the number of budget changes that can be submitted to GCC during the life of the agreement, with the exception of the last quarter of the grant agreement, meaning 90 days before the grant ends. Once you've been allowed to reallocate 10% of the total grant award, any other changes to the budget will be reviewed on a case by case basis for approval or denial. Also, if additional funds are approved to increase the total amount of the grant award, a budget change will need to be submitted to increase the project budget. The 10% cap will be increased to include the additional funds. Budget change requests can be denied for the following reasons. The adjustment exceeds 10% of the total grant award. It's inconsistent with the grant's purposes and objectives. The costs are unallowable it, or it does not support or furthers the program. A denial will occur due to supplanting. Supplanting is when federal funds are used to pay for services rendered, staff positions, programs, or materials that are usually paid by or with a state or local funds. Lastly, budget adjustments can be submitted 90 days before the end of the period of performance without justification. After 90 days, your grants administrator with reasonable justification can approve the change request on a case by case basis. The next section that will be, I will be covering is personnel and employee benefits. What are personnel and employee benefits? Personnel and employee benefits consist of items such as salary, paid leave, FICA, Medicare, and Social Security. Healthcare benefits such as hospitalization, vision, and dental. Retirement and workers' compensation. The payroll documentation uh, require a supporting documentation for your payroll and fringe benefits reimbursements. The first required document is the employee's pay stub. The required elements of the pay stub are employees, employee's legal name, gross wages, total hours worked, hourly rate of pay, or monthly salary, the pay period start and end dates, the pay date, as well as all deductions for taxes, and benefits. Here is a sample of a pay stub containing the required previously mentioned elements. The pay stub can also contain benefits paid by the employer. If the employer paid benefits are not listed on the pay stub, additional documentation is required for reimbursement of paid fringe benefits. The additional documentation will include the provider billing statement for the reimbursement period, coverage period, cover employees with the type of coverage and employee cost, and the total amount due. Proof of, proof of total payment to the provider is also required, as well as benefits allocation sheets for agencies with multiple funding sources. The next section will be time and activity sheets. There are two types of time and activity sheets, the single funding source time sheet and the multiple funding source time sheet. The personnel requirement for your organization and GCC grant agreement will determine the appropriate time and activity sheet that applies to each employee listed on your grant agreement. 
GCC time and activity sheets are required for all staff charged into the grant agreement and for volunteers. Time and activity sheets are required as part of the supporting documentation to receive reimbursement for personal expenses. The GCC time and activity sheet must be signed and dated by the employee and the employee supervisor. The executive director's time and activity sheet must be signed by the board chair or an authorized board member. The single, here's a sample of the single funding source time and activity sheet, which will be used by employees working 100% of their time on a single project or by volunteers contributing time for cash match to one funding source. The multiple funding source timesheet, which you can see here, is required for employees splitting their work, their work time between two or more funding sources or projects and whose salary is paid by more than one funding source. For example, an executive director or project director managing multiple grant awards or an advocate working on multiple grant awards. The time sheet must contain all hours worked during the reimbursement period from all funding sources. A few things to note about the time sheets are that all fields requested in the time sheet are required and must be completed for reimbursement. The employee's legal name is required on all documents, and the employee's name must match the name on the pay stub. The employee's name and position or title should be listed on the timesheet and must correspond the information submitted on the supporting documentation on EBS. Most importantly, the time and activity sheet must be signed by the employee and the supervisor with first-hand knowledge of the work performed. Wet ink signatures are required, however, electronic and digital signatures are permitted. The personnel cover page sample that we see here must be submitted with personnel and employee benefits reimbursement requests. Instructions for completing the personnel cover page are located at the bottom of the form or on page two. A personnel cover sheet is required with all reimbursement requests. Each employee listed on the personnel cover sheet represents a personnel line item on your budget. The total sum of the employer paid fringe benefits, FICA, retirement, and hospitalization for the reimbursement period should be included on the cover sheet. So if you have any questions or concerns on the items discussed, please contact your grants administrator to get clarification or for any questions related to um, the items presented before. For the next section, I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Johnston and I am one of the GCC grants administrators. Hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Yes, no. Yes. yes. Thank you. First, I will be presenting the supporting documentation for equipment. Supporting documentation for equipment must include receipts, invoices, or any other documentation supporting the purchase of the equipment. Copies of three bids from vendors are required when the equipment is $10,000 or more. A sole source provider form is necessary if there is only one provider who has the precise equipment you are trying to purchase. This form will have the justification on why you are choosing a sole source provider. Property tags are required for equipment purchased with grant funds and have a value of $5,000 or more. Property control record and equipment certification forms are required for all equipment purchased with grant funds, which needs to be uploaded in EBS attachments. All the above items should be accessible during the site visit and when submitting your reimbursements. Next, we will view the sole source provider request form. This is the sole source provider request form, which is located on the GCC website, which is www.nc dps.gov. Please note if the purchase is more than $250,000, 
there must be a prior approval from the Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs. On this form, you must complete the agreement description and ID, implementing agency, authorizing agency, program director's name, email address, phone number, and proposed dollar amount of the purchase. Enter the contractor's name, check the reason for the request, and if other is selected, you must provide an explanation. Enter the submitted by and the date of the request. Your grants administrator will approve or deny your request. The form will then be uploaded to the agreement for future reference. Next, we will view examples of the property tags. Here are some examples of property tags that are required for all equipment. The equipment must have a unique number assigned to them, which is a way to keep track of the equipment purchased by GCC grant funds. Next will be the property control record and equipment certification form. The top section of the property control record and equipment certification form will have the authorizing agency, implementing agency, agreement description and ID, program director's name, an email address. The rest of the form has multiple sections for different equipment. This section contains the item description, serial number, asset number, purchase date, vendor name, cost, purchased by, insurance coverage, assigned to, equipment location, and the purpose of the equipment. The next slide is the continuation page if needed. Here you will have the additional space if you need it. And next we're gonna go over the equipment cover sheet. The equipment cover sheet is required when submitting a reimbursement request. Agreement description, agreement ID, and the reporting period are required, preferably by the month when it was purchased. An example of the reporting period would be from October 1st, 2024 to October 31st, 2024. The document ID, which is the page number of the file that you're creating, item purchased, vendor name, cost per item, total costs, then indicate the amount of the federal share and the match share accordingly. You can find additional instructions on the second page of this form. Next, I will go over a couple of equipment updates. The threshold for the disposition of equipment has increased to $10,000. You may retain $1,000 to cover expenses associated with the selling and handling of the equipment. Next will be special purpose equipment. For special purpose equipment, the dollar amount requiring prior approval has increased to $10,000. Please see the CFR for more information. These updates go into effect on October 1st, 2024. Next, I will be addressing supporting documentation for consultants or contractors. Free contract request forms and unexecuted contracts must be approved by the grants administrator. The executed contract must be submitted to the grant administrator for upload to EBS prior to requesting reimbursement. Next is the pre-contract request form. Complete all the fields on this form. The agreement description, agreement ID, request date, agency name, individual name, hourly rate, rate per day not to exceed, the federal share to be reimbursed, the match share to be allocated, the grant period, description of the scope of work to be performed, the program director's signature, and date. The bottom part is to be completed by your grants administrator. Next, we will discuss some requirements when submitting a reimbursement. All reimbursement requests must have a GCC cover sheet. When submitting the invoices from the consultant or contractor for reimbursement, the vendor's name, dates of service, hours worked, payment amount due for the services, 
and a list or description of the services delivered from the consultant or contractor must be clearly displayed. Keep in mind the capped amount is $81.25 per hour and is not to exceed $650 per day. Otherwise, a contract excess rate request form must be submitted along with the pre-contract request form, copy of the unexecuted contract, and resume, if applicable. A couple of notes on this is remember that a new contract will be required for your new grants. Contracts should not cross over to a new grant period. Next is the contract cover sheet. Reimbursement submitted must have the contractual cover sheet filled out with supporting documentation behind it, which should include the invoice or invoices and the proof of payment. Provide the agreement description, agreement ID, the reporting period, the document ID, which remembers the page number of the file that you're creating so that we can locate that supporting document, contractor's name and title, service hours, rate, the total cost will be the hours multiplied by the rate, then fill out the portion for the federal share and the match share. Additional instructions are located on page two of this form. Next, you will find the contract access rate request form. Required on this form are the agreement description and ID, request date, agency name, contractee or individual, requested hourly rate, rate per day not to exceed amount, federal share to be reimbursed, match share to be allocated, grant period, and rate justification. The project director would sign and date the form, and the bottom portion is to be completed by your grants administrator. Next are some examples of consultants and contractors. Counselors, lawyers, software and hardware computer engineers, therapists and grounds maintenance staff are examples of consultants and contractors. Volunteers, board members, and employees do not qualify as consult consultants or contractors. Please remember that all the forms that I have discussed are available on the GCC website, which is www.ncdps.gov. I appreciate your attention this morning. And next up, we have Tanya Ogburn. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tanya Ogburn, Grants Management Supervisor with the Governor's Crime Commission. For the next few slides, I'm going to talk about supporting documentation that's needed for travel, supplies, and operating expenses. So for travel, receipts are needed for any conference registrations, along with a conference agenda or itinerary. Receipts are also needed for the hotel, the airline, taxi, or car rent. Meals and mileage for diem rates are based on your agency's travel policy. If your agency does not have a travel policy regarding the per diem rates, then the state per diem rates should be used. If you are using your agency's travel policy, the agency's travel per diem rates should not exceed the state's per diem rates. A mileage travel log form should be submitted as supporting documentation for any employee's mileage reimbursements. Out-of-state travel requires prior approval by your grants administrator. Out-of-state travel may have already been approved in your budget, but remember the budget is projected and plans can change. Therefore, prior approval is required. Also remember that a change request does not provide prior approval. It must be approved on the form you submit to your grants administrator. This is the prior approval form uh, for out-of-state travel that must be completed with all the necessary details about travel plans. Please provide your grants administrator with the name of the conference, the date of the conference, and an agenda or website with the conference information, adding the budgeted costs and a list of all attendees going to the conference at least 90 days prior to the travel. 
the travel cover sheet must be submitted with all supporting documentation and receipts after the travel has taken place. Please note that the per diem websites are at the bottom of the travel cover sheet for you to use if your agency does not have a per diem policy in place. You can refer to the instructions at the bottom of the form for directions on how to fill out the form completely. You should also send in the approved out of state travel prior approval form, if applicable, with the supporting documentation for that reimbursement. Now we're going to talk about supporting documentation that's needed for supplies and operating expenses. As you can see here, receipts, receipts, receipts. I cannot stress the importance of having receipts and or invoices when submitting your reimbursement claim. Again, it is vital that receipts and or invoices are part of your supporting documentation for any expenses you submit for reimbursement. Examples of these are vendor invoices. They would include utility bills, phone bills, rent invoices, and receipts for rent. You should also have a copy of the lease loaded into the attachments in EBS. You will also need proof of payment. Proof of payment may be a receipt showing it was paid with cash or charge card, a cancel check, not a copy of the check, or the bank statement showing that the check was clear. If you paid with a charge card, for instance, like a visa, we will still need the bank statement showing the charge card has been paid for that month. Receipts and or invoices must show the vendor's name, date of purchase or service, the amount due, and list of what services were performed or what was purchased. There are three methods that you can use to show expenses from receipts between different grants. The first one is to make a separate purchase for each grant and get a separate receipt for that grant. This is the preferred method. The second method would be if you're making a combined purchase, attach the documentation explaining what items were purchased for each grant. Remember to submit a copy of the receipt for each grant. You can write the grant number beside each item on the receipt. The third method, if you're also making a combined purchase, you can make a copy of the receipt for each grant, highlighting the items on the receipt, showing which items were charged to that particular grant. Submit copies of the documentation with all grant reimbursement claims. Here's a sample of an invoice that shows the date entered for payment. The invoice has the name of the company providing the service, the date, and the amount of the invoice. And you can see that it's stamped with the date that it was entered for payment. Here are forms of proof of payments that I mentioned earlier. Cleared or cancel check with a copy of the endorsement which is the back side of the check. Clear checks are usually available as a scanned image from your online bank account. Credit card or bank statements uh, are also forms of payment. Credit cards should contain the cardholder's address, the summary of account information, like the payment due or balance, and all other details relevant to the transaction being requested for the reimbursement. Here we continue with forms of proof of payment. A bank statement showing the expense cleared, uh, cleared or canceled check front and back that shows the endorsement, and an invoice showing the balance paid, and a receipt showing the expense was paid. A receipt is any document that contains the following five IRS required elements name of the vendor, transaction date, that's when you paid it. Detailed description of goods or services purchased, the amount paid, and the form of payment. Here's a sample, um, an example of a proof of payment. This is a check uh, produced by Intuit Payroll. The bank statement should be submitted showing that the check paid cleared the bank. This is a check showing what's direct deposited into an employee's account. The bank statement should be submitted showing that the check paid to the payroll processing company cleared the bank. This is a canceled check stamped on the back with the bank's endorsement and the date it cleared the bank. The 
The supply expense budget category should only be for office supplies and program supplies now that EBS allows you to have an operating expense budget category. Office supplies purchased with grant funds should be used for the staff working on that grant. Under office supplies, you see equipment. Samples of equipment under $5,000 would be items like computers, printers, and maybe copy machines. Under federal guidelines, a piece of equipment with a cost under $5,000 is considered to be a supply. Now, your agency might have a different threshold of what is considered a supply or equipment cost. You use your agency's policy on determining how you want this reflected in your budget categories. Just remember that any item over the $5,000 threshold must be categorized as equipment in your budget. Also, if you have an aggregate total, meaning one purchase, several items, same vendor over $5,000, that would also be categorized as equipment. Program supplies are for any materials and or goods supplied for the execution of the program. For example, if you have a CAC, maybe you would be purchasing items like children's books, crayons, or construction paper, and these would be program supplies. This is a copy of the supply cover sheet, and your instructions are at the bottom of the page of the cover sheet. Now, operating expenses are the normal cost of your agency. Here's a list of examples of what some of your operating expenses might be. You have rent, maybe payroll cost, insurance cost, utility expenses, which also means that you could have telecommunications, your phone bills, or your uh, internet bills, and cleaning services. This is the operating expense cover sheet. Again, refer to the instructions at the bottom of the form for direction on how to fill the form out completely. Next, we'll have Burley Spink, our team lead, that will, he will continue with the presentation. Good morning, I'm Burley Spink, your grant administrator, and I will be talking to you about match and reporting. Any funder may require that a grantee, which is a match, some portion of the funds that they provide. But what is a match? Match is the portion of the costs not paid by the federal government. When a federal grant requires the grantee to match funds, there are restrictions and regulations that govern what can be counted as match and how these funds must be documented. Additionally, Grant agreements specify what sources of match funds can be used and what type of match funds are allowed. Simply stated, match is the amount of funds that grantees are required to contribute to accomplish the purpose of their project. These match funds are subject to the same rules that govern federal funds, which means that if the cost is not allowable under the federal award, it's not allowable as a match. Match is usually described as a percentage of the total amount of the project. As you can see in the example, a 20% match of a $100,000 project would be $20,000. So to determine your match amount, take the amount of your award and multiply it by the match percentage required by the funder. There are two types of match. There's a cash, ma cash match, also known as a hard match, and the an in-kind match, also known as a soft match. Federal grants typically require the match contribution to come from a non-federal source. Cash match is the most common type of match, and as stated on the slide, is either the grantee's own funds or general revenue, or cash donations from non-federal third parties or non-federal grants. In simple terms, cash match is an actual cash contribution
This slide lists the line. Let me turn to 65, please. This slide lists the line items that can be used on your budget for cash match. Keep in mind that if your project does not meet the committed match funds, your agency may be required to refund a portion of the federal funds paid. In kind refers to resources besides money. In kind match are contributions or donations that come from the grantee agency or by non federal third parties in the form of the vows, values, sorry, values of personnel, goods and services, including direct and di indirect cost. As described in the slide, an in kind match or nine cash contributions, such as a volunteer time, volunteer's time or donations of goods and services directly benefiting the project, including donate, donated equipment, space, or utilities. For donations of goods, make sure the items are used to further the project's goals and objectives. Make sure to use fair market value to determine the allowable cost of the in-kind contribution. People sometimes volunteers to help your organization, or you use volunteers to help your organization. When using volunteers' time as an in-kind match, volunteer services must be documented and supported by using the same methods used to document employees' time and attendance records. Time and activity sheets must be signed by an authorizing official and include a description of the work performed directly benefiting the project. Our rates for volunteer services should be consistent with hourly rates paid to a regular staff performing the same work. If no comparison is possible, then rates should be consistent with those paid for similar work in the labor market. Make sure that your match contributions are verifiable in your records and are necessary and reasonable to achieve your project's goals and objectives. Make sure that your match contributions are not included as contributions for any other federally assisted project and are not paid by the federal grant under another grant. In simple terms, time and resources spent on one project should only be counted as match for that single project. Make sure your match costs are allowable and approved in the project's budget. Make sure your match adheres to requirements in our 2 CFR subpart D. Match contributions are subject to the same rules and the same support and documentation as any other expenditure made with the project's funds, as discussed earlier in the presentation. And although matching contributions can be applied at the end of the program year, your agency must consider how waiting to submit match until the end of the year will impact the utilization rate throughout the program year. The full match share must be contributed by the end of the award period. For income match contributions, make sure to document, document these areas. Who is the source? Make sure that your agency can demonstrate that the contribution is from an acceptable donor source. Who, what was donated? Make sure that your agency can demonstrate that what is being used as a match is suitable for a match. Be specific, be specific, I'm sorry, be specific and show how it relates to your project's goals and objectives. How is the value determined? The donor should generally determine the value and it should be based on standard objective sources rather than best guesses. Who verified the information? Who certified that the information is correct? Is there a responsible party who is prepared to sign that information as being true and correct? All these requirements are especially important for audit purposes. And again, make sure all your match adhere to requirements in 2 CFR 200. At the end of the program year, any remaining funds will be reported 
revert it to GCC minus the match funds. To finalize, it's very, to finalize, it is very important that you keep your records that clearly show the source amount and timing of your match contributions and that the full match share is met at the end of your project. For any questions regarding match funds, please contact your grant administrator. Now we're going to go to reporting. Timely reporting is critical to GCC's continued funding. Therefore, we need you as the subrecipient to complete your reports to us and other federal agencies in an accurate and timely fashion. Please be aware sanctions will be imposed on subrecipients who do not submit reports in a timely manner. Listed are required reports and due dates for all subrecipients. Please note that your notice of grant implementation and your initial subgrant award report are due immediately after your grant is open. Expense reimbursements are due monthly once the expense has incurred. Please note that all GCC projects require an annual report and that your progress report should align with the goals and objectives you stated in your grant application. Audit reporting. North Carolina state law requires every non-governmental entity that receives state or federal pass-through grant funds from a state agency to file an annual report on how those grant funds were used. For that, please see GS or general statutes 143C-6-23, administration oversight and reporting requirements. Specific requirements for each funding level are as follow. For your level one, Reporting that would be for grants less than 25,000. The required documents needed is a certification form and a state grants compliance reporting for receipts of less than 25,000. These forms and reporting must be submitted to the web address in bold. You have level two is for grants between 25,000 and 499,999,000. Two additional forms with the additional forms in level one are the schedule receipts and expenditures and program activities and accomplishments report. As you can see, please send these documents to your address in bold. Level three are for grants between 500,000 and 1 million. The three forms needed are submitted to the first email in bold is the certification form, the state grants compliance reporting and receipts of 25,000 or more, and program activities and accomplishments reports. Please pay attention that you must also submit to DEPS internal audit at the second web address in bold, a single audit prepared and completed in accordance with general accepted government auditing standards. Next level is level Three, additionally, are the grants of 1 million and more. You have the same requirements as the grants between 500,000 and 1 million. However, you must also post the single audit to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse. Please make note of the web address in bold at the bottom of that page. Next, will be Jason Wilmer for further instructions. Hello again. We want to leave this session with some additional resources for you. So you can find the grant forms that we discussed in this link located right at the top. We also have a link to our grant management guidelines that we're gonna insert and post to the website uh, following this presentation. Um, we have the link to 2 CFR 200 um, for the regulations, and we have a request to access EBS, which we're going to be posting with this PowerPoint, and the GSA site for per diem reference as well. 
I do want to direct everybody's attention to the GCC website also. It has some useful information, uh, and I don't want anybody to, uh, to miss out on the Justice Data Portal, the calendars, the processes, and other resources, which is also listed on the GCC's website. Again, we started the conversation uh, talking a little bit about our grants administrators. And what I wanted to make sure that everybody knows is that the importance that our grant administrators put on the relationship that they have with you, not only our grant administrators, but our entire staff, our planners, our grant administrators, our support staff, and everybody. Uh, we do have a customer service philosophy and tenants that go along with that. Um, we put a lot of value and importance on the technical assistance that we're able to provide to each of you as our uh, subrecipients, but also we enjoy being able to have conversations with you guys. So certainly reach out to your grant administrators, reach out to your planners for anything that you might need. Um, we'll look forward to talking to you and be able to help you any way that is possible. Um, we're going to move to our next presentation. Um, it'll take us just a moment to get reset. Um, so we'll have to uh, change PowerPoints and share different PowerPoints and things. But while we're doing that, we're gonna take about a five or six minute break. And uh, we'll see you back here roughly about uh, five minutes after 10. <laughs> 